Okay, thank you. So um, I'm going to, well, this talk is largely going to be a review of examples that some people, uh, maybe quite a few of you may have seen before, but they get successively a bit more complicated, um, but it relates, as you'll see, to some work I've been doing with Mahan, who's here, and at the end, I just want to try and explain that we found something rather unexpected and surprising in the course of our investigation. I'm not really going to prove much, and then I shall leave it to Mahan in his talk to um, do some sit more, you know. I'll try and tell you what we're talking about, and then Mahan will tell you the mathematics behind it. So, um, let me write some of this on the board, because I don't know, I can't ever remember what was on the previous slide. So we're going to always, in this talk, have a compact surface, and it may just as well be genus 2 for all what I want to say. And we're going to have a representation from the fundamental group of S into PSL2C. So these are hyperbolic isometries. And so um, this group, I'm going to, actually what I'm going to do is fix fix a hyperbolic structure on S. So S I'm going to think about as hyperbolic two space modded out by some Fuchsian group. And then this group is isomorphic to gamma. And it's going to be mapped by an isomorphism to some subgroup here. So G is rho gamma, and right, so that's the basic setup, and so if I look at H3, and I'm going to assume throughout the talk that this represent representation is both free and, well, sorry, faithful, so one-to-one, -one and discrete, so H3 over G is going to be a hyperbolic three manifold, which we'll call M. And it's a theorem which actually requires some quite um, serious topology, really, to prove that this manifold, so I'm just going to tell you this, is always homeomorphic to the surface. Well, if it's an open manifold, it's the surface cross R. Okay. So that's our setup, and I'm going to be talking about limit sets, which I know was the topic of one of last week's lecture courses and was mentioned again this morning. So the way I'm going to think about it is I've got my Fuchsian group gamma, which is acting here in H2, which I'll just draw as the hyperbolic disk, and there's different ways of defining the limit set. One way is to take all the attracting fixed points of all the elements in gamma, and they all around here. And in fact, if this is a compact surface, then the limit set here, so lambda gamma plus is the attracting fixed points, and then lambda gamma itself is just the closure of that, which is the whole unit circle in the case I, I mean, what I'm talking about extends to other cases, but let's just stick with this. And same definitions for G, but now the limit set of G, G is acting on hyperbolic three space in its boundary. So lambda G, which is going to be the closure of the, so G may contain some parabolic elements, so I throw in the fixed points of those and take the closure of that. And this set is contained in S2, which is the boundary of S3. And I shall usually think of it as the Riemann sphere. Okay. So what we're interested in is mapping the limit set of gamma to the limit set of G. So you can obviously map from the limit set the attracting point of something here, you can send it to the attracting point of its image. And then you can ask, does this map extend continuously to the closure? And it's a theorem 
that, as you can see, has been going along for the best part of 100 years in various degrees, and it probably still not finished this theorem, but this map extends to a continuous map, which by its definition really has to be um, equivariant from lambda gamma to lambda g. So in the case I'm talking about, when S is a compact surface, I think I'm right in saying Mahan finally settled that for all cases of g, right? Is that right, Mahan? Yeah, yeah, okay. So, but in, yeah? Sorry? Yeah. Okay, so the, the, the most famous case, well, actually, I, I mean, actually, the Nielsen stuff already is very interesting. So even when G is a Fuchsian group, this has real content, this theorem. But let's, um, the most famous case, um, it's possible to create groups G, which are images like this of surface groups, for which the limit set is the whole Riemann sphere. Now, probably peop many people have seen this. I'm, I'm actually not going to talk about this case in this talk, but um, I'm going to talk about something closely related to it. Um, uh, so in the case here, this limit set is a, a circle, and this limit set is the whole sphere. So in this example, you've actually got a, a space-filling curve as this map. So it gives you a hint. This map has to be pretty um, non-trivial to do that. Okay. So, I'm going to run through a whole bunch of examples of successive, yeah? It, I'm not telling you. All I'm saying is it's got to be a faithful, rep, discrete representation. So, in my different examples, I'll show you what the group may be. No, it, it, yeah, it won't be a shocky group because... Um, we're representing a compact surface. Yeah. So topologically, the manifold will always look like this. And in my successive examples, I'll talk about what it looks like geometrically. So first example, I expect many people are familiar with, are quasi-Fuchsian groups. And that's the case from this viewpoint. So we have this map, I sub rho, going from the limit set of gamma, which is the circle, to the limit set of G, which is contained in the two-sphere. So the first case could be supposing, uh, so I'm going to take, I'm just going to assume that this map exists, and it, it does in all the cases I'm talking about, so this map exists. Suppose this map is, I rho is, one to one. So it's a bijection from this to this. Then the image of this is obviously a Jordan curve, and it separates the sphere into two halves. It is not at all obvious that this Jordan curve is what's called a quasi-circle. Here are pictures of quasi-circles. So that means something about how bad, badly behaved this map is. I'm, I don't think I'm going to take the time to explain that, but um, these are various images. Forget all the lines inside. Just look around the edge. These, that's a round circle, and then these are quasi-circles. And a Jordan curve always separates the plane, or the sphere, into two parts. So we get two simply connected G-invariant parts in the complements of this curve. Yeah. Yeah. Classifying obviously. I am sorry, I, I don't know because I thought that the question of inclusion. And if it were inclusion, you were No, it inclusion into what? This is this is a homeomorphism to this set, but this set typically is not equal to this. Yeah, but how do you define the row? How do I define it? Yeah, because you said that it was obvious, but sorry. For no, 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 I didn't say it was obvious at all. What I said it's obvious okay, if I have a gamma in my Fuchsian group, right? And then this gamma has an attracting fixed point. On the boundary of H2. So, you know, I've got a, here's H2, and here's I've got an axis of something, and it's moving along this axis from a negative one to a positive one, yeah? Okay, so I take this, 
And then I look at rho of gamma. So that's something in SL2C. And let's make life simple, assume it's loxodromic. So it also has two fixed points on the boundary, one repelling, one attracting. Take the attracting one, OK? And so what's I rho is going to take gamma plus uh, to rho of gamma plus. OK, so that's a subset of here to a subset of here. And the big question is, can you extend this map? So I'm saying you can obviously write this down, and it's obviously G equivariant. The question is, can you extend it to a continuous map? That's to the whole of the limit. So that's the question. OK? So the first case I want to look at is the case when, so I'm saying you, it's a big theorem that you can always extend this map. Let's assume you can extend it, and it's a homeomorphism. And it's another non-trivial theorem that in that case, you always, well, the image of a circle is a Jordan curve. It's injective, right? So it separates the sphere into two invariant parts. And the, if you take either of the two complementary regions, so let's say the region inside this black line, that's invariant under the group. And in that part, the group acts properly discontinuously. It's a piece of complex plane, so the quotient has a complex structure, so it's a Riemann surface. So we get two Riemann surfaces associated to this. And the famous theorem of Baer's, Baer's simultaneous uniformization theorem, he says you can choose any conformal that's complex structures, any two, on this pair of surfaces. And there is a group for which the complementary pieces have exactly those two structures. Okay? And moreover, that up to conjugation, that uniquely determines the group. So I'm going to call the group that you get by this procedure Q of x, y. Now, if you ask me actually to find the group, that's a very difficult problem to solve some PDEs. But Abstractly, it always exists, and we're just going to take that. So here is a, or maybe I should draw a picture of a group like this. As the manifold, what does the manifold look like? So um, the manifold looks like this. So in the middle, there's a kind of compact part that contains all the closed geodesics in the manifold. So these aren't holes. Every, every closed loop in the manifold has a geodesic representative inside some bounded piece here. And then the thing kind of flares out. No closed geodesic penetrates outside here. And then at infinity down here, you get, you lose the hyperbolic part. You're on the boundary at infinity. You get um, a conformal structure. And here we have, say, omega minus over G, which I'm calling X. And up here at infinity, you have a piece of complex plane whose quotient is y. Yeah, it's called y. So that's what this manifold is like. And I can think of m. Yeah, that's the picture of it, OK? So there is a well-known result. What do I mean by continuous motion of limit sets? So supposing now, instead of one group here for g, I've got a whole family of them. And they depend on some complex parameter that I'm calling lambda. And that means just that I have certain generators of this group, and all the entries are just holomorphic analytic functions of lambda. Okay, And supposing I vary the lambda, and I ask what happens to the movement of this limit set, lambda g. And the theorem is that it moves sort of jointly continuously in the two variables. And actually, it's really better than that. This, if I fix the psi, so I fix a point here, and I let the lambda vary, I get a function which is a holomorphic function of lambda, which is a very useful thing. And out of this joint continuity, you deduce that if you have a sequence of these quasi-Fuchsian groups converging to another one, then the maps that we got from the 
S1 to subset of S2 move, well, they, they converge uniformly as maps from S1 to S2. Okay, so this is, so how do we know this theorem? There's a theorem called the lambda lemma in holomorphic dynamics, which some of you may have come across, of which this is a particular application. Of course, you can prove this directly, and in fact, it's one of a consequence of one of the theorems, sort of simple case of one of the theorems I proved with Mahan that we can sort of rederive this result. But anyway, this is a well-known result. So what I want to do for the rest of the talk is, so up here, my groups were staying in the class of quasi fuchsian groups where this map is one-to-one. -one. And my question is, what happens, or our question was, what happens as you allow the quasi fuchsian group that you get here to degenerate in some way, sort of go to the boundary of quasi fuchsian groups, what happens to this map? So there's the question. All right, so that's what I'm talking about. So, and I'm going to make life simple by just looking at sequences where I'm going to fix the bottom surface and allow this top set of surface to vary in various different ways. And in the different examples, you see all the different phenomena that I want to talk about. OK. <clears throat> so I don't know if I can make this work. I'm going to have a little movie break here. Let's see if I can make it work. Yeah, right. We're going to have a movie. So this is moving limit sets. And I was very proud of myself. It's the first time I've made a movie. Well, cut and paste in a movie. Right, so Peter Lee, well, I'm watching it come up. Peter Leeper is a computer graphics um, person who has a Vimeo website that has beautiful pictures on it. So these are pictures of quasi fuchsian groups for those who know what it is, these are isometric circles, and they're moving around, landing on complicated things. And now I especially want you to watch this one. So you see the plane separated into the inner colored part. See, something happened, and these circles got pinched off, and then they sort of twisted and unpinched. And if you watch carefully, they're going to twizzle around again more and more and more. See, there's sort of some kind of twisting going on there. So it's like this better. There's some twisting here, and then it pinches off, and it goes quite fast here. Another pinching happens, and I think that is, yeah, that's the end. Right, OK, that's the movie break. Yes? I think you're moving to something called bear slice. Uh, yeah, this is all in a bear slice. Right, I'm, I'm just to make the talk simple, I just fix a bear slice. But it doesn't, we don't, our results hold out more generally, but just, yeah. OK, I think I have to do this by hand. Um, yeah. OK, so um, the first couple of examples, in a way, explain what I was just showing you there. So we're going to talk about pinching. So what I'm going to do for the rest of the talk, I'm going to fix a curve around the top, well, really, I should draw this on S, but I'm going to choose a curve there that I call sigma, that's just separating the surface into two halves. And the first sequence of things I'm going to do is I'm going to make Riemann surfaces in which this curve gets shorter and shorter and shorter. So really what I want to say is that I'm talking about extremal length, but let's just think I'm making it shorter and shorter. I mean, you, you have to say, what length am I talking about? But in any case, we can make a sequence of groups. So we're going to make Q, X down here is fixed, and YN is going to be pinching. OK. And we, so Maskit has a theorem that says he wrote down exactly the formulas of quasi-conformal deformations that implement this. He sort of wrote down what you have to do to this region Y to to contract this curve, and it always converges to something, and it converges to a representation in which the rho n of any particular element in the group converges to a definite Mobius transformation 
in the limit. So what do you have to prove? You have to prove that you don't just kind of go away to nothing or to infinity. This thing is a definite matrix for the limit. And so here's what happened to the limit sets. Here is the kind of unpinched one, and that's what this movie did. It went like from this, and then this point and that point were fixed points of, say, rho n of gamma. And as n gets larger, those two points come closer and closer together until here they've merged into one point and it's pinched. So that's the kind of, and, you know, kind of obviously this picture converges to this picture. Yeah. Who? What? Q. Who's who? Yeah, I'm going to find here uh, Q of X, Y, Z. Okay, Q of X, Y is the manifold, the quasi, the, the quasi Fuchsian group, so that the bottom surface is X and the top surface is Y. Okay, so you could say GN. I just wrote Q for quasi Fuchsian. So I'm going to fix this and using Bayes' theorem find a sequence of groups where this top surface changes, okay? And the limit sets all move around somehow in some very complicated way and they land on this surface, on this picture, right? So the, um, what happened to this map, it can't anymore be one to one. In fact, we saw two points came together to one point it's a theorem of Bill Floyd that, in fact, the only place where this map in this example fails to be one-to-one -one is exactly at the pinch points. So there's really one pinch thing and then all its images around the place under the group. Right. And here's the manifolds which I've already, I've already drawn the one on the left. So, of course, this, the curve, this, this sort of thing goes really all the way through the manifold. Its geodesic representative is somewhere there in the middle of the manifold. But as you approach the limit, this gets very short. And what the distance between here and here has to get very, very large for that to happen. And in the limit, the top bit sort of goes way on up, up there to infinity, infinitely far away. And you get a limit manifold that looks like this. So, let me not dwell on all this. I mean, there's many things behind what I'm saying, but I want to give some more pictures. So that's my first example. And what happened to the limit set, I'll state a theorem in a minute, but what happened to the limit sets is quite what you would expect. But there is another example, which is quite similar to this, this one I've done. Now we're going to change what the YN is. And what we're going to do Instead of just making this curve shorter, we are going to start twisting the right-hand side of this thing relative to the left-hand side. So we're going to do a Dane twist, which involves, if I had a curve that was transverse to here, then in the next picture it will be wrap around and go like that, and then it will, in the next picture it will wrap around twice and go like that, and so on. And you can believe me that... Okay, so we're going to look at the limit set of these groups. Okay, I think this bit in blue, the people who are experts will know. The people who are semi-experts can read this. I'm not going to explain it. It's, you might say to me, what do I mean by phi to the n of y? So you have to talk about marked structures and tigmonist space and stuff, but let's not dwell on it. Um, okay. But what happens is that if I took a curve that crossed this sigma, I took a curve beta, on this top surface, it kind of gets longer and longer and longer. And the only way a curve can get longer and longer and longer is if this curve gets very short by hyperbolic geometry. So this is a slightly misleading argument because really we're doing something up here. But anyway, it's what happens. So the only way that this can happen is that this curve actually gets shorter um, at least the geodesic representative of this in the three manifold has to get short. And so there I've written L to the n of y of the sigma curve has to go to zero. So again, this curve sigma is pinched. And again, the groups converge to each other element-wise. Algebraic convergence means kind of element-wise. 
um, as you would expect. What about the limit sets? So here are pictures of the limit set. So this was like in the movie. Um, here is one of the sort of YNs for large N. And you see, instead of these two points just straightforwardly coming together, a whole lot of spiraling has been introduced, which is somehow coming from this Dane twisting here. And it, it's very fascinating to go through the detail of that so you can either read the paper of um, Kirchhoff and Thurston, which has got lots in it, or you can read Al Marden's great book, Outer Circles. He goes through like in enormous detail how this can happen. But look what happens to the limit set in the limit. You suddenly, this thing, if you just look at a kind of um, Hausdorff limit, so a limit of the pictures, you get this. So what has happened here is that this curve that's getting very short, it's not just getting a short translation, it's acquiring a lot of twisting at the same time for this to happen. And the shorter it gets, it twists and twists. And in the limit, if you just look at the kind of accumulation points of the sequence of group elements that you get, so you look at the limits of the group as a kind of geometric object sitting inside SL2C, you acquire an extra parabolic transformation that commuted with the rho infinity of sigma that you had. And this T sort of appears out of nowhere. An extra thing comes in. And this limit set is really the limit set not of G infinity, but the algebraic group that we had before with this one pinched, together with another element that is producing all this extra effect. So, right. So here's again a sort of comparison. Here was the just plain pinching. And here is what happens if, instead of just pinching, you twist. And then if you look at the Hausdorff limit of these limit sets, you get a picture like this. So this is really a very interesting example. Um, so here are now a few definitions and theorems. So a group, sequence of groups converges algebraically if it does element by element. That's just what you would think. It converges geometrically, however. There's a bunch of different ways of describing it, but I thought this one might be the easiest to understand. So you take a fundamental polyhedron for GN, and supposing you can find a sequence of these, or a sequence of Dirichlet domains with a certain center, which instead of converging to a polyhedron for G infinity, they converge to a fundamental polyhedron for a bigger group, and they converge uniformly on compact subsets of H3. So that's called converging geometrically. Uh, and if it happens that the two results give you the same thing, the convergence is called strong. And sort of as a general principle, if things converge strongly, it's, you can expect to prove good theorems. If they just converge algebraically, lots of strange things can happen. And to state the next theorem, let me just, another definition. I've talked about a fundamental polyhedron in 2D, <laughs> Having a finite-sided fundamental domain is equivalent to having a finite set of generators. In 3D, that's no longer true. You can have groups with a finite number of generators, but you can't find a finite-sided fundamental domain. You have to use infinitely many sides because of lots of spiraling going on. So a group is called geometrically finite if there is a finite-sided fundamental region. And this, again, these kind of groups are way easier to handle than other ones. So we'll, we'll come to the other ones in a minute. So here's a theorem. So this theorem was originally proved by Jorgensen and Marden in the, around 1990. And then it wasn't pushed to the, the opposite of geometrically finite. It's geometrically infinite. It would push to the geometrically infinite case in the light of a great many further developments by Evans later on. So here's the theorem. Suppose we have a sequence of these groups. And you can think that these guys are all quasi-Fuchsian. They don't have to be, but let's suppose they are in my setup. And suppose algebraically, 
we go like this. So point element-wise, we like this. But geometrically, we converge to something which might be different. Then they prove that the limit sets converge in the sense of pictures, in the Hausdorff metric on subsets. Right? So the limit sets converge to the limit set of the geometric limit, which is what we saw in the pictures. And actually, this gives us a condition for strong convergence. The two g infinity equals h if and only if the limit set of the algebraic limit is equal to the limit set of the geometric limit. So in my first, if I can go back quickly, in my first, whoops, in this case, the convergence is not strong because this limit set is different from this limit set. So this limit set is sort of sitting inside this one, but it's not equal. This, set, this one, the convergence is strong. OK, so uh, OK. Um, I think I'm not going to have time to go through this. So let me, this is an attempt to explain topologically the difference between algebraic and geometric limits. This is really what's explained in this paper of Kirchhoff and Thurston. It really repays a lot of study, this paper. So if you're at all interested in this subject, you know, this is a really powerful example. This is, so we have one, this is a very schematic picture of the manifold um, with the top surface y infinity. And actually, this should be called, it is called sigma, right? This is the thing we're going to pinch. In the geometric limit, we take two copies of this thing, and we stick them together along one boundary. You can think of it using Van Kampen's theorem. This extra thing, t, that came in has the effect of gluing on another copy, and we get sort of a, another copy of the whole, the whole thing. Kitten caboodle, if I'm allowed to say that. The whole stuff up here, same as down here. And the reason the limit set's so much more complicated is you're kind of seeing whatever you had here, and then you see it reflected and reflected and reflected around um, everywhere else, and it sort of doubles up. So this is what's going on here. Right, so now let me state some theorems of myself and Mahans. So the first theorem is, suppose we have strong convergence. Let me be a little bit vague what the exact conditions are, but certainly in the examples I'm showing, this, this is true. Supposing these groups converge strongly, then these maps on limit sets, not only do the limit sets converge, Hausdorff, actually the maps converge uniformly. So this is kind of like the best quasi-Fuchsian case, limit sets move continuously, uniform convergence, great. But now suppose the convergence was not strong. So the limit groups are different. And so we know from what I've said, the limit set, so the groups are different, the limit sets are different. If it was true that this converged to that uniformly, it would be a little exercise to prove that this limit set converged to that limit set in the Hausdorff metric, something about diagonal convergence. So that, but we know that's not true. So this thing can't converge uniformly. So what's the theorem, all right? What can we say? So here is the first thing that we proved. So we've got sequence of groups converging. The two things are not the same. And let's suppose that this geometric limit is geometrically finite, which actually implies so is g infinity. But let's suppose, so we're kind of in the geometrically finite case. Then we proved that actually these things do converge, but only point-wise. We lose the uniformity because all this twisting up somehow, uh, you know, near the, the parabolic points, it messes up the potential uniformity of convergence. And actually, to prove this, um, we partly made use of a result, uh, again, of Jorgensen and Marden, which says, as long as you stay in the class of geometrically finite groups, then actually this Dane twisting business is the worst that can happen. So really, if you can handle this Dane twist example in the geometrically finite case, then you're done. So that's what we had to very carefully analyze, what the effect of all this twisting on the, on the limit sets. So 
I'm not going to go into how we did that. But what I want to try and say in my remaining time, a bit more for people who knew more about this background I'm talking about. So I'm going to, we, we then went on to say, well, what happens if this limit group is not geometrically finite, it's geometrically infinite, which is infinitely much more difficult to handle, I would say. So these are the kind of, if you, the Cannon-Thurston map that I mentioned, the space-filling curve would come into this category. So I'm going to show you two more examples, and one is going to be very like the Cannon-Thurston example of strong convergence and try and give you, well, not prove that theorem A applies, but just give you a flavor of how that works. But the thing I really want to get to in my second example, we'll have an example where we don't have strong convergence, a famous example, and to our surprise, we found out that the second theorem also fails. So it's no longer true that you have point-wise convergence. There are certain very special points where the limit of the limit points is not the limiting limit point. Okay? So that's what I want to try and explain. So my third example. So all the examples are kind of in the same vein somehow. So instead of Dane twisting, well, I've got the same picture. I've got a similar sequence of quasi-Fuchsian groups. But instead of doing a Dane twist, so if you know about the classification of diffeomorphisms of surfaces, you can Dane twist, you can have finite order things, or you can have pseudo Anosov things. So we're going to have a map that I'm going to call phi from S to S, which is going to be pseudo Anosov. And I'll remind you in a second what a little bit what that means. Basically it means it it stretches in one direction and contracts in another transverse direction. And we're going to again, just again, look at this same sequence, but instead of Dane twisting to the n, so yn in this case is going to be q of x, and I may as well stick with x. I don't need to have a different surface. I'm going to look at this sequence of manifolds. So I've just done something which is a kind of more drastic thing on the top surface, basically. Okay. And here are some pictures of... <coughs> here is a picture of what happens when n is large. So I'm showing you a bunch of pictures. Um, I didn't draw any of them, except the really bad ones. Um, these ones were done by David Wright in our book, Indra's Pearls. Uh, well, uh, I, why or where? Why? why? Um, because Thurston and McMullen proved it. Okay, not obvious. Not obvious. It's kind of uh, okay. It's kind of the whole of Thurston's theory about ending laminations is sort of related. Let me. When I go a bit further, I'll show you more about the manifolds. And, but I'm not going to prove the limit exists, but it does. So here is a group which is a Q of x phi to the n of x for some large value of n, and the inside part, the inner um, component omega minus is colored yellow, so you can see it, and the outer part is white. You can see the limit set is very scrunched up, and here is the limiting thing. So don't ask how you managed to draw this, but you managed to draw it, and what's happened is the yellow part has completely disappeared away. So the sort of upper component here, you don't see anything. And in fact, remember I said <coughs> in the middle of the manifold, this quasi-Fuchsian thing, there's a kind of compact part which contains all closed geodesics. As we approach this limit, these two, this compact region gets larger and larger and larger. And in the limit, the top side of it just goes off away to infinity. Yeah? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, this is actually, sorry, this is a bunch of tourist groups out of Indra's Pills. Yes, yeah, okay. But, yeah, all right, okay. <laughs> right. Yeah, because we've got a lot of parabolic points here. So I, I don't know if there are any pictures of the other kind. Maybe Jeff has some, I don't know. Okay. 
Um, so it is a theorem, non-trivial theorem, that the convergence in this example, that there is a limit and it is strong. And the theorem of myself and Mahan says that therefore these maps converge uniformly, and you look at the picture, well, you know, this thing looks like it's converging to this. Everything looks true, right? So um, let me just say a little bit, so, so we can understand this, and so we can understand the final example better. Let me say a little bit about pseudo-Anosov maps. So <clears throat> a pseudo-Anosov map is a sort of... Um, generalization to a hyperbolic surface of an Anosov map. I think an Anosov map on a torus, which is something which has an expanding direction and a contracting direction. So it's kind of like that, but you can't do it quite as nicely, but for the present purposes, let me see if I've got, yeah, all right, this is a really crummy drawing. <coughs> but, <coughs> all right, so for people in the know, you have two you have two measured laminations, which sort of... So this is meant to be a picture of a measured lamination. And you should think of these are the directions in which things are expanding, say. And there's another... So they don't fill up the whole surface. They just fill up a bit of it, but the bits in between, you can reconstruct the dynamics in a systematic way. And then there is another transverse set of things like this, and this is another lamination, and along these green lines, everything contracts. And I've just, for what our purposes, really, we can just pretend that we've got two directions. So I'm going to draw y up here and x here, and I'm going to do what you might think is kind of unintuitive, but anyway, no, that's, um, what does this map look like? So it takes a kind of square box here, and it maps it to a thing which is contracted this way and expanded that way, like that. So here is what my phi does. Here is y. <coughs> now, if you really want to follow what I'm saying, you have to figure out which is stable and which is unstable. I'm going to make these guys be unstable leaves because stuff's expanding. And here we're going to have stable leaves. So these leaves are stable. So these guys are the contracting direction. Then I, a measured lamination goes with, so we have a transverse measure here, which is transverse to the unstable leaves, so it's the unstable lamination, so it's lambda u. And so lambda u, if I got that right according to my picture here, yeah, lambda u, is a measure that measures distance across here, which you can think is the y coordinate. And across here, you have the other one, which is lambda s. So, right, we don't want to, I don't have time to do a whole lecture on pseudo Anosov maps, but basically think expanding and contracting in these opposite directions. And now let me give you a picture of this manifold. So, the convex core of a three manifold, hyperbolic three manifold, it's the smallest convex set that contains all the closed geodesics, what I've been talking about before. And I didn't say it before, a group is geometrically finite if and only if the convex core has finite volume. If we don't have any parabolic elements in sight, if there are no cusps, you can think compact. So in our case, you can think compact. Right, so probably... All right, let me try... So somehow the key to all these well, after a great deal of expended effort, the key to understanding these geometrically infinite manifolds is to try and make a model of what they look like, a sort of coarse metric or picture of them. So here is my rough picture of the convex core of the limit manifold. Well, the mn and the m infinity. So here we're going to have the surface x. And so I think really this is a genus 2 thing. 
And then we're going to have a lot of levels in the manifold. And then at the top, we're going to come up with the surface phi n of x. So this is the same surface hyperbolically, but we've changed the marking. So which curve is labeled as which curve is changed dramatically by this pseudo Anosov map. And so the convex core is roughly this bit. And then it flares off here, and it flares off here. So this is mn. And this level here looks like phi to the jx. And the distance from here to here is kind of 1, roughly. And it turns out that in this particular case, you can put an approximate metric on this thing, which looks like this. So <coughs> um, you can read this or not as you like. It's explaining how we decide whether which of these x and y directions is contracted. And which, so it's kind of counterintuitive. You, you, you contract in the, along the unstable leaves when you change the marking. So here's a metric. So if I measure sort of t up here in that direction, and on this surface, I'm going to measure x along this direction of the unstable leaves, y along the stable leaves, and the stuff that's kind of not on any leaf, I just fudge it somehow in amongst. It doesn't really matter what I do. I just sort of interpolate somehow. So it turns out that the manifold has a model like this. And what's the limit manifold? Well, instead of this, it just goes on to infinity in the same way. Okay. Right. So here is the model of m infinity. And what happens? So here's a picture. So there's my m infinity going off there. And um, let's take a curve that was down here. If I apply this pseudo, so we take a curve on f. If I fix this surface, this hyperbolic surface, and I apply any pseudo Anosov map over and over again, this map, whatever the curve was, it gets longer and longer and longer, and eventually it limits on, I guess, the unstable lamination. But it gets longer, is that right? Unstable one? Yeah. It gets longer and longer and longer in the metric, hyperbolic metric on this surface. But if I go up to this surface, then the labels, the, the surface has got the same metric, but the labels have all changed by phi. So the thing that was labeled gamma down here is now labeled phi inverse gamma. But, and so, OK, so you work out precisely which is phi and phi inverse. And you discover that the length of the curve phi to the j of gamma on this surface here is the same as the original length of the original curve down here. So a curve that down here was got longer and longer, on this surface, it's just got a fixed length. And it's roughly, what, what this model means is that the geodesic representative of that sort of short, short curve is roughly at this level. And then at this level, it'll be phi to the j plus 1 and so on. So the upshot is we've got a sequence of curves whose geodesic representatives are kind of roughly higher and higher up the picture. And they're all going out this way. Down here, they'd all be getting longer and longer. But here, they're staying of the same length or approximately the same length. And that is what Thurston defined as an ending lamination. Or the limit of these curves is an ending lamination. And these curves, if you know about the theory of projective measured laminations, these curves converge to a lamination. And if you know about laminations and you work it through, you discover that, indeed, this sequence of curves converges to, this is proving that in the projective measured laminations, it converges to um, the unstable lamination. So the ending lamination of this thing is the unstable lamination. OK. So now I'm going to, here's a proposition, and I'm going to do this because in my final example, this is important. But let's look. Let's look in this manifold M sub n. So what does this say? So lambda u is a, is a lamination, and these curves, phi, n, and gamma, are converging to it. 
So in the Fuchsian group, I have a leaf L that belongs to the unstable lamination. And here I've got my manifold M sub N. And on every level, I've kind of got a copy of this X, but on every level, the way I label everything has changed. The marking has changed. So on every level, not only can I think I can find copies of all the curves, but really these are sort of pleated surfaces in here. So on the top level, I can find, you can think that there's a copy of this leaf of lamination sitting. So there's sort of a copy of L up on this thing, which is supposed to be like phi to the n of x. Now what I claim is, what this proposition is saying, is actually there are lots of copies of L, just as there were lots of copies of the curve gamma all the way up, but they, their lengths all got different. The copy that's up here is actually nearly geodesic. So the nearest bit thing to being geodesic for a copy of L is up here. So what that means is, if I would pick two points on L, and in the three-dimensional manifold, try to go on the shortest path. So who knows what the shortest path is? It's like, maybe it's like this, right? So actually, what this proposition is saying, that's wrong. Actually, this shortest path can't come down so far. It's got to stay quite close to here. And how do I prove that? So I haven't written the proof, but you first of all, on every level of this, project onto the y-coordinate, the unstable leaves, and you project onto a, a, a you project onto an unstable, uh, you project onto a, a hyperbolic geodesic. You contract length, but then you project upwards. And remember, the metric was something like um, dt squared plus c to the minus two t. I'm going to put it the wrong way around. dy squared plus c to the 2t. dx squared, I, no, I got that the wrong way around. I think it's dx as well. Anyway, you finally sort out which you think it is. The point is, as you contract, the length along the unstable leaves is measured by dx, and that contracts. So you contract distance as you go up here. And if you know anything about quasi-geodesics and hyperbolic geometry, all this contracting is enough to prove you did better to just go near to L. So this thing is realized up here. And that kind of shows you why, in the limit, the leaf of this lamination, so it had two endpoints here. But in hyperbolic three space, the image of this thing is going further and further away from the middle. So it's two endpoints are kind of going out to infinity. And in the limit, the two endpoints come together. So that's a theorem, um, I guess originally due to Yayaminsky, that this, all right, that these two points come together. So if I take a leaf of this, then the endpoints map to the same point in the limit limit set. So maybe that gives you an idea what all this talk about ending laminations being not realized in infinity just means there's no geodesic that represents it because the two endpoints of it map to the same point, so you can't connect them by a geodesic. That's all realized means. And here is a theorem which in various de degrees of generality is due to these people. So um, this map on limit sets is one to one, except at the points where you've collapsed because it's the end of a leaf of the lamination. So this limit set is so complicated because you've scrunched up all these points. Right, now I'm going to take a little bit longer to explain the last example. So the last example is a famous example of Jeff Brock. And we've got almost all the ingredients now. So <coughs> instead of taking pseudo and off, I'm going to go back to my curve sigma. And I'm going to find myself a map which we've got kind of the left-hand surface and the right-hand surface. And this map restricts it to the left-hand surface. It's just going to be the identity. The map restricted to sigma is going to be the identity. But the map restricted to the right-hand surface 
is going to be some pseudo Anosov map of the right hand surface. Okay, so you can concoct maps like this. And we're going to do just the same thing, look at the sequence of groups. So now what I'm doing, instead of doing twisting here, I'm scrunching up this side in some very complicated way. What happens? Okay, well here, sorry, here are, oops. Here are pictures of the limit set. These pictures were done by Jeff Brock. So Jeff Brock's thesis is all about these examples. So here we're very near. I confess I don't completely understand this, but anyway, we're completely very near the limit, and here we've reached the limit. So again, there's a kind of complicated procedure from here to here. And what happens in this example, as Brock showed, just like in this Dane twist case, as you approach the limit, this guy has to get shorter and shorter and twist more and more, and in the limit, a new parabolic element appears that commutes with this one, and it means that the geometric limit and the algebraic limit are different. Sorry? Yeah. Sorry? The picture on the left is the right section Is degenerate. Yeah, yeah. Partially degenerate. I, I don't fully understand this picture, but it's, you know, yeah. So this is what, it's, it's almost. So the round circle that you see there, this? that corresponds to the part where you're. Where you've not done anything. It's, it's the vector. So the SL, that's, that's what that, This bit. Nothing happened. But this one is getting very short, so they're getting almost tangent to something else. And the scrunched up ones, it's SR. OK, so here's our theorem that surprised us. So the theorem is, oh, sorry, that's the wrong gamma. There are points in the limit set of the Fuchsian group for which this sequence of images does not converge to this. So if it was geometrically finite, we said this converges pointwise to this. We're saying now there are some points where it just doesn't converge. And we can say precisely which points these are. I think my time is getting short. So we can actually say, not only do we say there are some points, we show that sort of, um, I guess it's right to say almost all points converge. So most points converge, but there are some exceptional points which when we draw the lamination, you always have certain complementary regions of laminations. Well, it's a little complicated because we've got the... Um, sigma, but this is kind of a complementary region. These boundary things are um, the ones where <coughs> the endpoints of one of these leaves don't converge to the endpoint of the limit thing, which has collapsed. So let me try and explain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So really, I should be drawing that. Really, I should be drawing like this. I should be drawing a picture like this. So I should have sigma here. And then on the right-hand surface, on one side of this, I have a lamination, which actually, its boundary in the cover, it would look like this, wouldn't it? So this is kind of all carried to it, limits on sigma. So I'm talking about a leaf like this or a leaf like this. Okay. Um, so roughly what's going on <coughs> is, this side of the surface, this side of the whole thing behaves like the previous pseudo Anosov example, and this side behaves like a nothing example. This and this stay bounded distance apart. This and this get infinitely far apart. This side goes up and up and up, and the only way that can happen is if this becomes shorter and shorter, so there's a kind of very uh, sort of long, thin bit here, so this surface gets kind of distorted, but if you chop off somewhere, it looks like it always did, and you have to go a very long way to get across here, and then this side gets, goes off to infinity and gets scrunched up. If I take a leaf of this, this un, the unstable lamination somewhere on here, then just as in my previous example, it goes up and up and up and up and up, and in the end, it's not there anymore. It's quasi-geodesic, just like in the previous case. 
So it goes up and up and up and up and up. And in the limit, it's not there anymore. Its endpoints come together, and that's it. But in the geometric limit, what happens? Um, OK, so let's, here's an approximating manifold. One side sort of stays put. The other goes up and up and up. Here is the algebraic limit. One side's gone off to infinity. But in the geometric limit, we take two copies of this, just like we did in the Kirchhoff-Thurston case, turn the other one upside down, glue them together along the side that's kind of good here, using a map T that mysteriously appears. And we sort of get two copies of this. And this side of the thing is fine. And here we get an end going off to infinity. So one of the ends going off to infinity is here. And then we get another end going off to infinity here. And this little leaf that I cared about is here. And although down here in the algebraic limit, it's, it's nowhere in sight, it's just disappeared, actually, because this half of the surface sort of stayed put, in the geometric pictures, you see this side as much as you see this side. There's a remarking trick that says you see this side. So this little leaf stays put here. And so it kind of is within you know, finite space. So in all the examples, it's a uniform quasi-geodesic at bounded distance from the origin. So its endpoints stay a uniformly bounded distance apart. So it, it, it doesn't collapse. Well, I've suppressed the reason why. <coughs> I, to, to make sure it stays a bounded distance, I have to be very careful about my lift of this leaf. <coughs> I have to make sure I can get to it going up this left side which means I have to lift the pseudo-Anosov to the cover so that the leaf is fixed on it. So if somebody cares about this, you, but, but it turns out it has to be a boundary leaf for, to be able to make the lift properly, to make this argument really right. But that's why this thing, so that's how we find our counterexample. Okay, and I shall stop.